right, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be continuing here um, in our series on the book of Romans. And as we talked about the book of Romans, you know, just to kind of give a quick sum up, you know, the Apostle Paul is teaching about God's wrath towards sin, his anger towards sin, but then the amazing grace of God that we are justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. We learn about God's plan for the Jew and for the Gentile. And as we hit chapter 12, we start to talk about and learn about God's will for our lives. Now, we kind of talk about what is God's will for our life. You know, that could be kind of it's a funny qu question we ask ourselves sometimes. Like, it's interesting. You know, like, what do you want to be when, when you grow up? You know, it's that same kind of thought process. You know, the kids are back in school and, you know, and they're trying to figure out what they want to do uh, with their lives. I remember as a, as a kid growing up, I, there's all kinds of things I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. You know, I wanted to uh, be a garbage man for a while. You know, I wanted to be Superman, an engineer. You know, it went, it went all over the place. The garbage man, because I thought it was cool how they got a ride on the back of, of, the, of the trucks. I just thought that, that was so cool. I, I wanted to do that. And I heard as a kid they made $20,000 a year from somebody. And I was like, oh, man. Man, I, score. Also, I was going to be a garbage man, and, and, but, I thought it was, but I thought it was cool hanging on the back of a truck. And so I had all these things I wanted to do, and uh, then when I was 16 years old, I went to church for the first time. It was kind of cool. Uh, Tamara brought a, new, a young lady here. It's her first time in church, and she's like, she wanted to know what we did in church. And so Tamara was like, hey, well, come and, come and check it out. And so, you know, she, they're hanging out with the kids today. Uh, but it was my first time when I was 16 and, and heard the gospel message, was convicted of my sins, ran to the altar, gave my life to the Lord and at, at this church, you know, of, uh, how many people when there are 800 people or so, and ran to the front. I didn't care about anybody else. I just wanted Jesus, and I wanted to give my life to the Lord and felt called to go into the ministry quickly afterwards. And so I got so excited before. I was like, what am I going to do with my life? And now I knew I wanted to go into the ministry. I knew that was God's will for my life. And I got so excited and I was learning about all the different aspects of ministry, reading all the books about ministry, going to Bolts. I had experienced uh, this group called the Master's Commission. This is actually where I went to school and they were doing inner city ministry in Baltimore. And it's where I got my passion for inner city ministry. And I would go there uh, during my summer breaks in high school and and participate with them doing ministry. And I was just so in love saying, God, is this your will for me? Is your will to do this, do that? And I was constantly going, getting frantic saying, Lord, what exactly do you want me to do? Until this, this um, older pastor friend of mine, he sat me down one day and he had one of those kind of talks with you. And he was like, listen, God's will for your life isn't so much about what you're going to do. It's not about your job. It's not if you're going to be a pastor here or there, an evangelist here or there. You know, God's will for your life is not so much what you're going to do, but who you are, who you are in Christ. And so as we go through Romans 12, this is kind of what Paul is talking to us about. Who are we supposed to be in Christ? What is God's will for me to be as a Christian you know, every single day. What, what am I striving toward in my everyday walk with Christ? Not necessarily the big things. And God does call us to the big things and to this thing and that thing. You know, he calls us to these things, you know, to our jobs and our professions and, and all of that. But it's who are we in Christ? Who, how are, who are we supposed to be? And so we, the last two weeks we went through Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. And so we're actually going to finish the rest of the chapter, I think, tonight. But just uh, we're going to go ahead and read those two verses and just do a quick sum up, and then we'll go on. How much, what time is it? So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So the first thing Paul says, here's the will for your life. You know, it's the least you can do is to offer up your body to God as a living sacrifice. Not as a dead sacrifice, but every day to live your life for God. Now, when we make Jesus the Lord of our life, again, our spirit man comes alive. 
uh, there, our spirit man doesn't, doesn't have a sin nature anymore inside of it. We have been set free. We have been delivered. Okay, the Holy Spirit of God is connected with our spirit. This is the part of us that's connected with God. But we still live in this, this uh, fallen flesh, and we still have a soul, our, our mind, will, and our emotions that has to be renewed every single day through the Word of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. But, so he, but he says that you are supposed to uh, offer this body, even though it has this muscle memory, this desire to still do sinful things of this world, you're supposed to put it down. You're supposed to put it under. You're supposed to discipline that body and offer it every day as a living sacrifice to God. Then he goes on in verse 2 and says, and do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so he gives us two commands here in this verse. We're not to conform to the world, and we're to be transformed every day by the renewing of our mind. And so he says, don't just go with the crowd. Don't conform to what everybody else is doing. As believers in Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be a counterculture people. We're not supposed to be like everyone else and what everyone else is doing. You know, we are citizens of the United States second, you know, but we are subjects to the kingdom of God first. We are not, we might live in this world, but we are not of this world. Like we talked about on Sunday night when we were going through the book of Revelation chapter 13, we don't belong to this world. You know, we belong to the king. And so we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind every day. How does that take place? It takes place through the word of God. You know, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's the word of God that transforms our mind. As we read the word and as we speak and confess the word of God, it transforms our mind. And so what we do is we have our mind come into agreement with what the word of God says, not with how we feel or not with what the world is telling us. We come in agreement to what the word of God says. And the cool thing about reading the Word of God, as you re read the Word of God, it opens up your mind, it opens up yourself to the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is attracted to the Word of God. And so as you're planting these seeds of the Word inside of yourself, it opens up you to, to hear from and to receive from the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes you're like, Man, I, I don't feel anything. I come to church. You talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't, I don't sense it. Get in the Word of God. The Word of God is what plows, you know, that field that loosens up the soil. It's what prepares you, you know, for uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so then, you know, when our mind is removed, we'll know what that acceptable, uh, that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is for our lives. You know, when we talk about the will of God, I, my favorite verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, it says, tells us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to all things give thanks. You know, this is the will of God for us. And so the, the will of God is so much more than, am I supposed to be a missionary here? Am I supposed to uh, be a teacher at this school? Am I supposed to have this type of profession? Am I supposed to go into this business? You know, the will of God is about who we are in Christ, you know, and, and, and um, renewing our mind here through the word of God, it talks about, and walking in obedience to the word of God. So let's move on with, the, with chapter 12. Let's try to get past uh, verse three today. And he says, um, for I say, through the grace given to me, now this is Paul talking, he says, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And so he's moving on here a little bit, and he's going to start talking about uh, the body of Christ as a whole and how each of us are different members of the body of Christ. You know, maybe you're a thumb, maybe you're a finger, maybe you're a toenail. I don't know. You know, you might be the knee. You know, we all are different parts of the body of Christ. But he goes on here and he says, don't think you know, more highly of yourself than you, than you should. Have a sober mindset. Now, he says this after verse 1 and verse 2. So if you're doing verse 1 
and you're offering your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord every day. And you're doing verse 2, and you're renewing your mind daily through the Word of God and not conforming to the world. Your spiritual walk is going to be is going to become awesome. You know what I mean? And you're going to you're going to be begin walking, you know, in God's presence. You're going to be like getting revelation from him. He's going to be opening things up to you in the word. He's going to be setting up divine appointments to you in life and you're going to notice them and be able to minister to people here and minister to people there. And he says when you begin to walk in the Holy Spirit and you begin to walk by the word this way when you're walking in the will of God, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to because we're all part of the body of Christ. Don't think that you have gone beyond somebody else in the body of Christ. To think you have achieved some type of higher rank in the kingdom than somebody else. Because the way that God judges rank in the kingdom isn't necessarily the way that we judge rank here on earth. And he gives this example when he says here, through the grace given to me, so he's saying, look, look at, look at, you might look at me at the Apostle Paul and say, well, you're the Apostle Paul. I mean, look at all the revelation and the grace that God has given you and all of these awesome and amazing things that God has done in your life and through you. And then he says also to everyone among you. So whether you are the, the chief apostle or you are a brand new Christian in a church, he says, listen, don't think too highly of yourself, you know, because God has given every single person a measure of faith. What makes a difference between person A and between person B is, ha is how they operate in the measure of faith that they have been given. That measure of faith might be different, but spiritual maturity doesn't come from God. It's like he says, oh, I choose you, Diane. I'm going to pour out all this blessing upon you, and you're amazing. He gives every person a measure of faith, and every single person has to choose to activate and exercise that faith individually. Your spiritual maturity, your spiritual growth, and, and, and how you elevate in the kingdom of God is all determined by you. God gives you grace, but then you have to act on that grace. You have to spend time in the word. You have to spend time confessing the word. You have to spend time uh, maturing your faith by believing what the word of God says, even when the world and situations come against you. You know, depression comes on, you say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, when I'm struggling with weakness, I'm going to confess that the Lord is the strength of my life and claim what the word of God says and walk in the strength of the Lord, even when I'm feeling weak. When sickness tries to attack my body, I'm going to claim the word of God that by his stripes I was healed. And I'm going to command that every symptom from the devil to leave. And I'm going to walk by faith in Jesus' name in my healing. And so it, all of us have to operate in that on our own. Now, I didn't give you this scripture, um, so but don't, don't pull it up. If you have a Bible or your Bible app, just open up to 2 Corinthians uh chapter 12, because I just want to expound on this, um, just one, one minute here, what Paul is talking about here, about this grace that's given to him. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, um, we'll just start in verse 1, and it says, Paul's talking, he says, it is doubtless, uh, it, um, where am I at? Yeah, I lost my, had a little note here. Okay, it is, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, uh, and some people think this is Paul talking about somebody else, but others think that he's talk, Paul's talking about himself in the third person by the way it shifts in a bit. But he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, uh, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So he has this, this he gets caught up into, into heaven. He's raptured up there. And he says, and I know such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, 
which is not lawful for a man to utter. So I mean, he's saying he got this revelation. He heard these things that were beyond uh, human understanding, things that God wasn't, had, wasn't going to be sharing with the rest of, of mankind. Uh, verse 5 says, Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning these things, I pled to the Lord three times that I might, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, Your gra my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so here he's saying, like, Paul, he had such a, he had such a revelation from God. He had experienced such amazing things uh, from the Lord. Paul says, listen, even, even all the things that God has shown me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to boast. I'm not going to think myself above anybody else. I'm, I'm just a member of the body of Christ. I'm not going to think myself uh, above anybody else. He says, I'm just going to boast in my infirmities. I, he says, I know who I was. I know my failures. I know my weaknesses. I mean, Paul was a Pharisee who persecuted Christians, who oversaw the murder of Christians, who rounded them up to be in prison. He spewed all kinds of hatred. And so he says, I know who I am. So I look at my weakness. I look at my infirmities. And But by God's grace, he transformed me. And then Paul operated in this measure of faith that God gave him and, uh, and, and, and used him. But he had such a revelation, the Bible says, that he had had this thorn put in his side. Now, this isn't like, like, a, like a rose bush, you know, you know, you're, uh, you know, we had life group, and Marianne was coming into our house uh, for a life group, and I had this rose bush that was overgrown. Marianne, where are you at? And she, you know, she pricked her finger on it, and I, I felt horrible because, you know, because she was holding onto the rail, and I didn't, I didn't trim it. And I said, "Oh, by the next time you come, Marianne, I'll take care of it." Next life group came by, she pricked her finger again. <laughs> Kelly, we got to take care of that, you know. Next before she comes again, but I think it was like three times she did it, so maybe third time was the charm. You know, I'll remember next time and and trim the rose bush. But it's not that kind of thorn. This think think this scripture is referring to, referring to a place in Ezekiel, and it's more of a thorn, kind of like uh, think of barbed wire. Okay, so it's like this barbed wire, he says, that's, that's put around him. And it says, and, a, and a, a messenger from Satan was to buffet me. Now, it wasn't like buffet, like wrestling, like, you know, they're pushed back. Okay, the, this word for buffet means to be struck in the face. Okay, and so he's like, this, this messenger from Satan, you know, you know, struck him, you know, to keep him down. And it says it was done lest he be exalted. Now, that seems like a weird thing. Like, why would God do that to any person? Here, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out, God says. I'm going to put barbed wire around you and have this, you know, messenger from Satan, you know, keep striking you in the head. I mean, that just seems kind of cruel. Why, why would God do that? Well, Paul had such a revelation from the Lord and, that, and he had walked in faith, you know, in such an amazing way that, that it he, God allowed something to happen to his life where he had to say, you know, uh, like Jesus was basically saying, not my will, your will be done when it comes to the cross. You know, I don't, it had to be a place where Paul, Paul was saying, I'm going to, I'm going, my strength is in the Lord. You know, I, I might be weak, but I'm going to continue to be strong in the Lord. It's kind of like um, uh, when Kenneth Hagin tells a story about how when he was a young man, he was, uh, he was laid up in bed because uh, he had been, he was paralyzed from the waist down. God healed him. After God healed him, he was still weak. He, his, his muscles hadn't worked for years. And so he, his body was, was all ripped up, totally weak. And so, but he had to go to work because uh, it was during the Depression and everybody had, you know, he was trying to earn some money. And, and I, I think he was working like with apples or something, you know, picking apples out of a tree. And, uh, and so he would work from sun up to sun down and he didn't have any strength. And every morning, he would, he would go there, and the, the bigger guys would kind of mock him, like, How, what's this little puny guy? You know, it's all frail. What's he going to do? Every morning while he was, he'd wake up, he, so he would quote that verse I told you, the Lord is the strength of my life. You know, in Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is the strength of my life, and nothing would happen. He would get dressed. The Lord is the strength of my life, and in the natural, nothing happened. He got in the truck 
you know, to, to ride there to do his job. The Lord is the strength of my life, and nothing would happen. He's still weak. He's still hurting. He's still, still sore. He gets out of the truck. He, he picks up the tools. The Lord is the strength of my life. Still nothing. He's hurting. And then by the time he went to work, the Lord is the strength of my life. And he worked from sunrise to sunset, you know, and outperformed every single one of the other guys. And then by the time he got home, it would, it would, he would lose that strength again. But the strength came from the Lord. And eventually, you know, the strength, his, his physical, natural strength returned to him. But, in, in, so, but Kenneth Hagin was able to praise God in his infirmities because God was the strength of his life, literally. And so this is what happens to Paul here in verse 3, that God was the strength of his life because, you know, he had such revelation that God allowed this thing to happen so that Paul would press through, you know, he would continue to operate in faith. He would walk by faith, not by sight. So God, so sometimes there's adversity in our lives, and that's not like God is, you know, hating on us or he's against us. When adversity is in your life, will you continue to operate in faith? Will you continue to say, I walk by faith, not by by sight. I continue to move forward in the midst of the adversity because I choose to believe what the word of God said as truth and gospel, not what I'm feeling, not what I'm seeing, not the circumstances that's in my life, not the infirmity that's in my way, not that thorn, not that barbed wire, not that message from the devil that's bopping you on the head. No, I'm going to trust what the word of God says and continue to move forward in God's strength. Does that make sense? Amen. And so he's so, here in Romans chapter 12, he says, don't think more highly of yourself. Whether you have, you know, if, if you have, whatever level of spiritual growth you have achieved, you know, uh, boast in the infirmities because God is the one who strengthens us in the midst of those infirmities. And so we're all part of, of the body of Christ and then the other interesting thing here in verse uh, 3, he says, each one has been given a measure of faith. And what he's saying, now everybody's given a measure of faith, and we have to utilize that faith. We have to mature that faith. We have to grow that faith. It's like the parable of the, t of the talents. You know, the, the guy who had the one talent, you know, remember the story? He buries it in the ground. He hides it. But the, the other two guys, the one that had five talents, he went and utilized it, invested it so that he had 10. Uh, the other one that had um, uh, three talents, you know, he utilized it, invested it, went, grew it from three to six. And then you know, the other guy, he just, he hid it away. And the master comes back and praised the guy who made the five, 10, praised the guy who made the three, six. But the guy who had the one and hid it, you know, he, he, you know he, he got on him. You know, he says, listen, you could have at least have just invested it in the bank and gotten a little bit of interest. And maybe their interest was better back then than it is now. I mean, I don't even know why you put your money in the bank anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't, there, there's, there's, you don't get any interest. It's like, I think the last interest sell was four cents, two cents. You know what I mean? It's like, that's, that's awesome. But so anyways, they, he had a, yeah, I'm making it, I'm making it big with my interest. Um, so, but he says, so that, with that one thing, it's still, it's like faith. You know, so many of us, you know, we get a measure of faith and we don't do anything with it. God has called us to grow our faith through the word of God. And the only way it grows is through exercising it, using it, operating in it, in it. but we all might have a different kind of faith. Okay. A different measure of faith as far in, in terms of spiritual gifts or, um, in the church. And so he goes on in verse 4, and he says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. You know, we can't all be a nose. We can't all be ears, a mouth. Um, so he says in verse 5, so we, be, so, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts diff, uh, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So all of us, whatever, whatever gift you have been given to utilize with your measure of faith, use it for the kingdom of God. 
Not everyone's called to be a pastor. Not everyone's called to be an evangelist or a prophet or, you know, uh, uh, any of those things. Not everyone's called to be, you know, a business. You know, we all have different gifts. You know what I mean? So he breaks that down here. So the first one he says, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. And I love this thing where he says proportion to our faith. I'll get to that in one second. But if we go through this list of spiritual gifts, you'll see other places in the Bible where there's other lists. So this isn't like um, uh, a full list. It's more of a, a sum up. Because when he talks about prophecy, you know, I, I think he's, you know, speaking of the spiritual gifts, you know, uh, referring to the ones in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 um, and through 14. And because prophecy out of those, those gifts, the, the spoken gifts, you know, tongues, he says that, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is speaking through you in tongues, but no one can understand it. You know, interpretation, if you have that gift, allows people to hear it. But prophecy, you're being led by the Spirit to speak life into somebody else in a language that they can understand. And so if you have the gift of prophecy, you can speak encouragement and life through the, the Holy Spirit to another person. And so... And so there's the other spiritual gifts, you know, healing and, and words of knowledge and discerning of spirits and uh, wisdom and uh, faith and working of miracles that are listed there in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but he said the prophecy out of those spoken ones was the greatest one. And if you tie it into something like word of knowledge or wisdom, you can even speak future and things into people's lives and stuff like that. But he says that uh, to do this in proportion to our faith. I love this because sometimes people get discouraged and they, they look and they see, well, this person, you know, they're a great, you know, saint of God. You know, I, I'm a peon. I can't be like this person, you know, who's up there. He says every person is to operate in the portion of fa proportion of faith that they have, meaning that if God's given you this much, operate in that. Operate in whatever God has given you because that is God's will for you to operate in what he's given you. And when we, and the God says, you know, um, you know uh, if you're faithful in the little things, he makes you ruler over much. And so as we begin to operate in the faith that God's given us in the spiritual gift that he's called us in, then it begins to grow. And then it begins to grow. And then the assignment gets bigger. And then the assignment gets bigger. And then it begins to multiply and he adds other things. So we have to operate in, the, in faithfulness into what God has given us. So maybe your, your spiritual gift, you know, the faith that he's given you is to operate in one of these, um, these uh, gifts of the spirit that we talked about. But then he goes on, he says, verse seven, or ministry, you know, let us, uh, let us use it in our ministering. Now, this is the same word that they get the word deacon from. And so, when, so you might have the, these uh, operating the spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit, but you might be called to be a servant. You know, a deacon, what a deacon is supposed to be doing, uh, when, the, when the apostles uh, set up that office, they were, they were um, operating um, in their apostle office, but they said, we can't, we can't do these other, meet these practical needs. I mean, it would take away from preaching of the word. And so they assigned these godly men who feared the Lord and knew the word. You know, they were, they were the amazing men of God, but they gave them the assignment to do the practical work of the ministry. And so that practical work of the ministry is just as valuable as operating in these spiritual gifts or through the preaching of the word. It's just a different function, but both are equally important. And each person should, if you're called to that, should operate in that gift with, this, with, um, with passion and take ownership of it and treat it as, as, a, as, as a ministry of the Spirit. And so if you're, if you're called to, to a deacon type of ministry, that more practical type, man, do it with all your heart. Do it with a smile on your face. You know, encourage others to participate in that practical work of the ministry because we have to have both. He goes on, he says, and he who teaches, you know, um, you know, let him teach, you know, so we can minister in, 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 in teaching. You know, this is, uh, goes along with, you know, uh, the pastoral gifts or evangelism, you know, the office of prophet and, uh, and, and apostle. But, you know, the, these are important, you know, to, in teaching. I like how he listed teaching because sometimes teaching one is, gets lost sometimes. You know, we get excited and we like, the, like a service and somebody gets us shouting and we get, we, get, we get excited, you know, and then we go home and it's like, 
What do I do with that? You know what I mean? And not that it, they both have a purpose, but teaching of the word of God is so important because the teaching of the word of God develops faith inside of us. And so we, we have to have, uh, we have to have a balance of, of all of it. A uh, healthy diet per se. And you can't just have the chocolate cake. You got to have the vegetables. Hey, I made this awesome spaghetti sauce yesterday. It was, I called it Daddy Bolognese. I invented it for the kids. Yes. Um, but I mixed all kinds of vegetables in it, and the kids didn't know it. It was like all chopped up, and I threw it inside. And, and so, so, you have, so we have to have all of it. You know what I mean? We got to have the, the healthy and the, the other stuff. And so he says, and he who exhorts an exhortation. So if, you, if God's given you the gift of encouraging, man, encourage people. You know, you know uh, be that light, uh, whether it's in small groups or in large groups. He who, gi- he who gives uh, uh, with uh, uh, liberally, you know, he says, so if you're, if you, some people God has called to be a giver, you know, that he has, he has blessed you. Now, now being called to be a giver doesn't, doesn't mean that you, doesn't, the size of your bank account isn't what's important, okay? You could be called to be a giver with a small bank account, and you could be called to be a giver with a big bank account. I've seen some people who operate in this gift of giving, you know, more efficiently with a small bank account than the person who has the big bank account. And so, and so it's important that if God has called you to, to be a giver, to, to do that. You know, to um, even if it comes down to, hey, you know, we, we go out to eat and, okay, I'm, I'm buying, you know. You know, we're not splitting the check. You know, I'm, I'm going to take care of it. Let me be a blessing to you. Let me give and, and help you. And, and you'll find that some of the people, you know, if, if you're faithful in, uh, and, in being a giver, God's going to put other givers in your life to be a blessing. You know, like I've seen that in my life, you know, where God has been like, hey, listen, I want you to operate in giving. I want you to give, you know, to this or give to that. And, and I'm looking at my bank account and I'm like, I don't, you know, you know what I'm saying? You know, you've been there, right? And you just, you give anyways in obedience. And then God brings someone else in your life to, to give to you, you know? And so, you know, I, I just love how God sets that up in our lives. You know, he who leads with diligence you know, maybe you're called to be a, a leader, to operate in a gift of administration or, or, or something like that. That's, it's an important gift of the Spirit. You know, but whatever it is we're called to do, we, need, we, we do it with all of our hearts. We operate in that faith that God's given us. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so and we need a lot of mercy, you know, in this world, you know, to operate in that mercy. Sometimes, you know, the Bible teaches us so much about uh, uh, forgiveness, you know, since we've been forgiven by God, you know, we need to be forgiving of other people. And, and so to operate in this gift of mercy is, I believe, it's more than just saying I, I forgive somebody, you know, and I don't hold it against them. And that's essentially what forgiveness is, is saying I'm not going to hold that thing against that person anymore. I'm not going to let it affect, uh, affect me anymore. Mercy goes a step beyond that. You know, mercy is about restoration. Pastor Bob operates, operates in this gift, you know, where he'll, he works to restore, you know, people, you know, that have been broken or damaged, you know. And so that's, it's important to operate in that, uh, that gift. You know, if somebody stumbles and falls down, it's the job of the Christian not to kick them while they're down, you know, or to be, or say, God bless you and walk to the other side of the road. You know, we're to get down in the dirt with them, you know, pick them up, help them back on their feet, and sometimes it takes time, you know. You know, people, you know, you start, you operate in mercy, you know, and you're helping someone to get back on their feet with the Lord, and they might take, you know, two steps forward and one step back, you know, two steps forward, one step back. But that, that with, with just with that example, that person has already gone two steps forward, you know what I'm saying? And so mercy is, is able to be patient with the step back and be able to help help them walk. And so God's called us all as the body of Christ. And he's given all of us a measure of faith to participate uh, in this ministry. And so we all got to find our part and be, and, and know who we are in Christ and to operate together. Because like I said, on the body, you know, if, if, if my foot's like, you know, I don't like this job, you know, I'd be hob- jumping around or hobble on a crutch, you know what I mean? You know, we, we, we all have to do the, the assignment and the job God has given us. 
And when we're faithful in the little things, the Bible says God makes us ruler over much. Then he goes on in verse 9 and he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Now this hypocrisy comes from a word that comes from the, uh, the word that means mask. You know, back in ancient times when actors would, would do a play, you know, they would, they would change parts by holding a mask over their face. You know, now I'm this person and now I'm this person. Okay, and so he says, you know, don't be a, don't let love be without hypocrisy. You know, don't do it behind a mask. Let it be real. Let it be genuine. You know, God has given you the faith to give real love toward other people. Now, let me give you something with this. You know, say if you, if God's called you, you somebody, you, you need to give them love. Okay, you need to measure, but you don't feel it. Now, you can step out in faith and give it anyways. That's not hypocritical, okay? That is, I'm stepping out in faith, and I'm being obedient, and I'm going to love that person regardless of my feelings. The hypocritical thing is when, if, I'm, if I act one way around them, and then I go and talk about them over here and stab them in the back over here. You see the difference? And so, and so you say, well, I don't feel it. That's okay. You can still step out in faith and show the love of Jesus Christ and have it be real. And so he says, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. This is the will of God for our lives. Hate evil stuff, but grab a hold of the good and don't let go. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. So, you know, we're supposed to love one another in honor, giving preference to one another. So how do, we, how do we affectionately love one another in brotherly love? We put other people first. You know, in, honoring, you know, in honor, giving preference to one another. So honor other people. Put other people first. Help somebody else win. Um, verse 11, not lagging in diligence. You know, God's will is for you to not be lazy. Uh, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, ooh, continuing steadfastly in prayer. So he says we're rejoicing in hope. What does that mean? I'm rejoicing. What is, what is hope? Hope of, uh, is that I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. My hope of salvation is I'm spending forever with God. So regardless of what the situation's going on in my life today, I watch the news and I see all the crazy stuff happening in the world. I can still smile. I can still rejoice because this is not my home. I'm going to be spending eternity with my heavenly father very soon. And so I can still rejoice in my destination. And so I can look at the world right now and say, man, things are crazy. And so, Father, help me to be about the mission that you've given me to advance your kingdom on this earth but I'm going to rejoice and celebrate because this is not my home. I'm spending forever with you. And so it also it allows me to be patient in tribulation. All these things happening around me, but when, I, when I'm walking in the faith that God has given me, you know, <clears throat> the tribulation won't beat me down. I can be patient in it because, you know, I know that it's just for a season. I know that greater... Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. I know that I'm more than an overcomer. I know that in the spiritual, I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. So I can be patient in tribulation. And he says, and continually, steadfastly, continuing steadfastly in prayer. So continue to pray. Pray without ceasing. This is kind of put hitting back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, uh, distributing to the needs of the saints. So it's important for us to, to, to help other people physically. You know, that's why we did Festival of Hope. That's why we, we give to missions through BVM. This is why with, through 517 Ministries, we support uh, Feed the Hungry. You know, we're feeding 100 kids right now uh, every day through that. And why do we do that? The Bible tells us that when, we, that when we give to the poor, we're loaning to the Lord. And the Lord always pays back. And so it's important for us to, to give to those who are in need, to support the saints. And again, going back to the body he's just talking about, you know, if I, if I stub my toe, I'm going to give to my toe. You know, I'm going to 
put ice on it. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to it. I'm not going to be like, you know, stupid toe, you can take care of yourself. If my attitude was stupid toe, you can take care of yourself, it's going to affect the rest of the, my body. I'm going to be hobbling around. I'm not going to be as efficient. You know what I mean? And so when, when someone in the body is suffering and hurting, it's our responsibility to help and meet that need and care for them because we're all part of the body of Christ. Amen? And so he says, uh, um, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hosp uh, hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And that's a tough one, but he's like, you know, to to make that a habit to, I'm going to bless those that persecute me. I'm going to rejoice with those who, excuse me, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so we celebrate in each other's victories. We cry with each other when someone is hurting. You know, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Uh, do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all people. So, you know, don't go, you know, he says don't repay, again, he's going back to the same thing, you know, as far as um, um, not repaying evil for evil. But he says, look for the good things inside of people. You know, find the, find the good thing inside somebody. You're like, that person's terrible. Well, let's there's, there's got to be something good in that person. I'm going to help pull that good thing out of that person. I'm going to pray for that person. Verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. And we live in this world right now. He's like, how do, how do I do that? Well, as in my world, in my surrounding, the area that I can control, I'm going to live in peace with all men. I'm not going to compromise you know, living in peace isn't compromising my beliefs for somebody else, but I'm going to do my best to uh, keep things, to live in peace with each person. Um, verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will, pre I will repay, says the Lord. And so he's saying here, listen, God is the one who's going to repay all evil. You know, we don't need to be doing that. Our job is to uh, pray for the other person, to forgive other people. And so then he goes on in verse 20. He says, therefore, because of all of that, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And how, how, how can I do that? Well, didn't Jesus do that for us? While we were enemies, Christ died for us, you know, while we were still sinners, you know? When we were enemies of God, when we were children of the devil, Christ died for us and rescued us. And so we are to show compassion on, on, our, on our enemies. It's easy to love our friends, but it's harder to love our enemies and to, and to pray for those. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you, you uh, submit or, 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 or um, compromise uh, your beliefs. That's not what that's saying. And sometimes Christianity gets perverted that way. But it's saying that I can still reach out. I can still pray for those that are in need. It says, if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Talking about the enemies. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. As you act with compassion and kindness, you know, to someone who operates as an enemy, it will bring conviction upon their lives. And why would we want to do that? Because that conviction will draw them to salvation and bring them to Jesus. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so he's, he, again, by operating in the spirit of God, what is good? The good is the word of God, operating in faith. And so as I operate by what is good, that is how I'm going to overcome evil in this world. And so as we say, how do we change this world that's around us, these things that are happening? How do we oppose the spirit of Antichrist that is running rampant in the world? It's by operating in the love of God, you know, by ministering uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this, again, this is not, this is not compromising. This is not excusing sin or anything like that. 
This is saying, I'm going, I'm going to unashamedly preach the gospel with power. I'm going to stand upon the word of God to rescue people from the gates of hell, to bring more people into the family of God. You know, people are like, well, why are you so different? All these crazy things are happening in the world. How can you still rejoice? How can you still smile? How can you still stand? How can you still operate with integrity? Because I'm not doing it on my own. The Holy Spirit of God dwells with inside of me. And that peace that I have that passes all understanding, you can have that same peace too if you put your faith in Jesus. He tells us to let our light shine among all men. How do we let our light shine in a world that's, that's like today? By being patient in tribulation, like you talked about here just a little bit earlier. As we're patient in tribulation, as we stand strong in the armor of God, not allowing the pressures of this world to beat us down, but by saying that the Lord is the strength of my life, I will not fear anything or anyone we walk that way it is a light to other people because people are lost they're full of fear they're looking for hope and we can bring answers to all of those different things amen and so um is jeff around so father we just praise you lord i thank you for this word lord i pray that uh, it would encourage our hearts lord that it would build, uh, develop our faith and Lord, I just thank you in Jesus' name.